What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 16 of the Black Massacre series, where today I will be discussing the Slocum Massacre of 1910. The Slocum Massacre occurred on July 29th through the 30th, 1910, in Slocum, Texas, an unincorporated community in Anderson County near Palestine in East Texas. Only six deaths were officially confirmed, but some 22 were reported by major newspapers. This is the official account and is estimated as many as 100 African Americans were killed. Historians have offered several explanations for the sparking of the riot and massacre by whites. At the time, rumors placed responsibility on the blacks, saying that whites had armed in response to accounts of blacks planning a race war. The whites from the mob did their best to destroy any local evidence against them. African Americans appealed to higher levels of government for a fair investigation, but little to nothing was done on their behalf. As a result, the African American population in Slocum declined drastically as many left in fear of their lives. Long before the Slocum massacre occurred, racial tensions had been part of the state's history. In East Texas, where the majority of blacks had lived since before the American Civil War, enslaved African Americans had been bought by planters and traders to develop and work cotton plantations. Several counties had enslaved black majorities. In the aftermath of the war, whites resented the emancipation and enfranchisement of former slaves. In the post-Reconstruction era, Conservative white Democrats regained control of county and state governments and passed laws at the turn of the century to disenfranchise African Americans. By the turn of the century, there had already been at least 335 lynchings, of which 261 victims were black. Most of these lynchings were based on allegations of whites against blacks. Even though the justice system discriminated against African Americans, most lynching victims never received a trial. A number of lynchings of African Americans in Texas had taken place in the time before the Slocum Massacre. African Americans had struggled to gain social equality as well as economic equality. They were frequently assigned only old overworked plots for growing crops as tenant farmers of sharecroppers. They kept their farming land to smaller sizes to avoid troubles with jealous whites. The combination of unfruitful land and small farms made blacks more susceptible to falling into debt when they didn't have a good harvest season. Given the turmoil between races, black people felt threatened if they tried to advance economically. The Slocum Massacre was originally said to have been sparked by two separate events. First, there was an argument over a promissory note between Marsh Holly, a black businessman, and Red and Alfred, a disabled white farmer. Holly had not thought it was a serious argument, but whites heard that Holly was trying to cheat a disabled farmer, or Alfred had lied and said that Holly was threatening him. Secondly, a black farmer, Abe Wilson, was sent to inform people of road maintenance in the area. A white farmer, Jim Sperger, got upset because he thought it was a violation of white supremacy to have a black man helping the community. Again, rumors distorted events. Wilson was rumored to be supervising a white road crew, which upset whites. Sometime after the massacre, some people wondered if Sperger was worried about African Americans flirting with his daughters. Another reported cause of the Slocum massacre was the defeat of James J. Jeffries, a white boxer, by Jack Johnson, a black boxer, in what was billed as the fight of the century. Resentful whites caused more than one race riot in 1910 after Jeffrey's defeat. Though these stories most likely contributed to the Slocum Massacre, locally white people in Anderson County believed rumors that a black uprising was being planned in retaliation for the recent lynching of a black man in the area. Whites put out a call to white men from nearby counties to come to their aid. As a precaution, the whites hid their women and children in schools and churches before setting out to hunt down blacks. White men stocked up on guns and ammunition and drank alcohol. District Judge Benjamin Howard Gardner realized that the combination of alcohol, guns, and rumors about black uprisings could create a dangerous and potentially deadly outcome. Before the bloodshed began, he tried to counteract it by imposing a court order that closed all saloons, gun stores, and hardware stores, but he was too late. White men involved in the massacre had already obtained their weapons. The violence began on July 29th, when six white men confronted a group of black teenagers. Most of the teenagers escaped, but one was murdered by the mob. 
Soon after, mobs of up to 50 white men were formed throughout Anderson County. These groups raided black neighborhoods and attempted to kill any black person they encountered. Some mobs shot, th shot African Americans as they tried to flee through the forest. The Slocum massacre lasted through the night for a total of 16 hours. Though only five casualties were confirmed, the casualty count was likely much higher. Sheriff William H. Black said that men were going about killing Negroes as fast as they could find them, and so far as I was able to ascertain, without any real cause. He also described it as there was just a hot-headed gang hunting them down and killing them. They were just hunting the Negroes down like sheep. After the bloodshed ended, Sheriff Black and Sheriff Lacey from the surrounding area arrived in Anderson County to address and investigate the killings of African Americans. When they arrived, they said everyone was afraid and all white males were armed. Sheriff Black and Godfrey Rees Fowler went to the scene to complete a thorough investigation of the events. Sheriff Black ruled that whites did not have a legitimate reason to kill since whites attacked even the, when the blacks did not. Deputy Sheriff Stubblefield was also called to the scene. Whites in Anderson County armed, warned him of a threat of assassination by an African American. This shows that whites were still fearful and willing to kill. Because of the fear in both the white and black population, Governor Thomas Mitchell Campbell ordered Texas Rangers and the state militia to Anderson County. The Texas Rangers began their work by helping black women and children. On their search, black neighborhoods were empty. Black property was frequently stolen. Deaths of an elderly couple was unrelated. The rangers confirmed that black people believed that white people were hunting them. Even with the rumor of a black uprising against whites proven false, Marsh Holly, a witness to murders and one of the reasons that the Slocum master began in the first place, was put in jail as protection. He denied that the promissory note was the cause of the massacre. It was said that the burial site of African Americans was on A. Wilson's land. Some say that there were six deaths total and the deceased were wrapped in blankets, put in pine boxes, and buried in a trench. Others say that bodies were thrown in the ditch. Others reported seeing bodies abandoned in woods, fields, and cane breaks. The final death toll was never determined, but by the 1920 census, at least one half of the black population had left Slocum. Black resident Jack Holly survived the massacre. He fled the area with his family. He left the granary, dairy, and general store that he had built up as a freedman. Other Holly family survivors included Willustus Lusk Holly, who witnessed his brother Alex being murdered. He escaped by playing dead and soon moved to Fort Worth. Reagan and Marshall Holly stayed in Anderson County for the rest of their lives. Besides the Hollies, seven other men who died in the massacre were Cleveland, Cleve Larkin, Sam Baker, Dick and Jeff Wilson, Ben Dancer, John Hayes, and Will Burley. Newspapers including the Palestine Daily Herald, Fort Worth Star-Telegram, Greensville Morning Herald, Fort Worth Record, the Galveston Daily, New York Tribune, and Abilene Daily News all mention that conflict in Anderson County was started by African Americans or race riots, which put partial blame on African Americans. This caused violence towards African Americans to increase insignificantly. However, the Palestine Daily Herald told some parts of the truth about how white people thought that African Americans were plotting against them. The title of the article in the New York Times was Score of Negroes Killed by Whites and discussed the wrongful killings of African Americans and the poor reasons behind the massacre. Twenty years after the massacre, a man named Hayes owned the land in, owned, owned land in Slocum that the town needed. In exchange for the land, he requested that the city establish a historical marker to remember those who were killed. His request was denied. The town said it no longer needed the land. Despite efforts by African Americans to draw attention to the massacre, the federal government remained largely uninterested in investigating the murders or bringing criminal prosecutions. John A. Sidden, a Volga postmaster, sent a letter to Cecil A. Lyons, chairman of the Texas Republican State Executive Committee in Sherman, asking for his help in securing a federal investigation. Lyons forwarded the letter to the United States Attorney General George W. Wickersham. It is unknown whether Sidden even received a response. 
a group of local black ministers also appealed for federal help in a letter to President Taft. They wanted a doctrine of fairness and a suffrage granted to them by the government. With no loopholes and under the protection of the law, Taft sent this letter to Wickersham and he responded to the ministers by saying that the federal government could not fulfill their request or become involved because no constitutional rights were being violated in any of these instances. However, the federal government did become involved when a Mexican-American was lynched in Texas. In the early 21st century, the Slocum Massacre is considered by some to be forgotten because it is not taught in Texas public schools. Some have even said that it didn't even happen. In 2011, the 82nd Texas legislator adopted Resolution 865, officially acknowledging that the massacre occurred. It stated that the murders were unjust and wrongfully committed, but did not commit the legislature to conduct an investigation. During the early 1900s, indictments and prosecutions tended to side with white mobs when it came to crimes against African Americans. Anderson County District Court Judge Benjamin H. Gardner released a statement that said that law enforcement would start turning away and shooting to kill, if necessary, those who sympathized with the mobs or participated in them. He also said that he would no longer tolerate law enforcement officers who favored the mobs. Gardner called a grand jury to identify suspects in the case and intended to prosecute men indicted as a result. After investigations and arrests began, Texas Rangers arrested Josh Bishop, Isam Garner, and Walter Ferguson Reeves. Reeves arrested Sperger, Jim Sperger, who was involved in one of the initial conflicts. G.W. Bailey, Morgan Henry, Frank Bridge, Andrew Kirkwood and B.J. Jenkins were arrested as well. Despite the investigations and arrests, law enforcement was unable to conclude how many people had died at the hands of the mob. Judge Gardner knew that whites would have the majority even if a crime was committed, so he asked the jurors to excuse themselves if it was possible to complete a fair trial. On August 5th, S.C. Jenkins was arrested and Ferguson and Bishop were released. On August 14th, Lusk Colley and Charles Lee Wilson were summoned as witnesses and Curtis Sperger, Jim Sperger's brother, was arrested. On August 17th, the murder charges were released. No indictments were made for the murders of Alex Holly or John H. Hay or the attempted murders of Charlie Wilson and Lusk Holly. Of the indictments, two cases moved forward, but they did not make it to court. By the time the cases were ready for trial, Judge Gardner had been replaced. The new judge released all suspects for $1,500 bail. Gardner still wanted these men behind bars. He knew they were dangerous because he encountered Jim Sperger and Kirkwood in public. Sperger hit him in the face and Gardner had to pull a pistol on Kirkwood. His desire for justice was never fulfilled. Both Sperger and Kirkwood remained free for the rest of their lives. The list of suspects are as follows. Josh Bishop released. Isam Garner Four first-degree murder charges released on a $1,500 bail. Walter Ferguson released. Jim Sperger, two first-degree murder charges released on $1,500 bail. G.W. Bailey released on $1,500 bail. Morgan Henry released for $1,500 bail. Frank Bridge released for $1,500 bail. Andrew Kirkwood, three first-degree murder charges released on $1,500 bail. B.J. Jenkins four first-degree murder charges released on a $1,500 bail. S.C. Jenkins, three first-degree murder charges released for $1,500 bail. Curtis Sperger, three first-degree murder charges released on a $1,500 bail. Lusk Colley, witness, and Charlie Wilson, witness. Well, that's going to conclude episode 16 of the Black Massacre series, where we covered Slocum Massacre of 1910. If you have not done so already, please be sure to go out ahead and check out the other episodes in the Black Massacre series playlist. And stay tuned as we will be traveling to another location next week for episode 18. I'm sorry, a 17 of the Black Massacre series. Be safe and be one.